21st century is um, more of a reflection about the process by which we've been working with instructors who are veterans and who maybe not, uh, were not as comfortable with technology as they wanted to be. And uh, we also have a population at Front Range Community College, uh, which is dominated, at least in our department that we're talking about today, by adjunct instructors, people that are there part time. So there's a couple hurdles to, uh, to clear there. But really, this is a social description about a process that we, uh, uh, we explored, not a technical one. So if you're, if you're thinking, no, nope, I wanted some, something more uh, technical than that, then we won't be insulted. But definitely, you're welcome. Um, my name is Jim Piccolini. Uh, I'm the Learning Management Systems Coordinator at Front Range Community College and also an instructional designer. What that really means is guy who takes care of D2L for us. Um, and uh, I do training with individuals and groups. And we like groups better because there's more, uh, more leverage, uh, more bang for the buck. Um, and I partnered here with Kathy Gamble. Hi, and I'm Kathy Gamble. My role in this, I am the TESOL director at Front Range Community College. And TESOL stands for Teaching English as a Second Language. So we are training teachers to teach ESL, mainly to adults either abroad or here in the United States. Within our department, we are all adjunct, so that does make a difference for us. Pardon me? Yes, and so I'm also a teacher in our program. Uh, what, what, the way this has worked is I come up with ideas for, here's what I'd really like to do. I'm not sure how this is going to work. I don't know where to go to find these resources, so I go to Jim, and he helps put things together for us. So that's kind of how we put together our presentation today as well. Here was the problem. This is what I came to him with. And then we went from there. So our goals, we were working with um, non-tech focused veteran teachers. Most of our instructors have some technology background or some training or are using one or more tools. But we found that we're not all using the same kinds of tools. So we wanted to be able to share and benefit from what everyone else is able to do. So our goals were we wanted to make it useful for the faculty. It, we didn't want to come in and say, we're going to train you on this wonderful tool. See you later. Goodbye. We wanted to find out, how are you using it? Let's make it applicable so that you can share it with someone else within our department. We involved our members in the process. We'll give you some examples of how we do that. We wanted to establish long-term connections. We've now been working on this for a couple years, and that's why we consider it successful. We still have our instructors coming back to say, where are we going next? What are we doing now? It's not a fast process uh, because we've involved them. It's been uh, over the long haul. I think that's part of the reason it's so successful, though. So the first project I want to talk about is our podcast project. Within Front Range Community College, we have the opportunity to apply for some in-house grants. And so this was funded through a grant that we got through our technology online learning. online learning. So our instructors were creating podcast style lessons that could be used by individuals or instructors. So, um, we'll give you some examples of those a little bit later. So we've also used it. Tesla instructors have used podcast lessons podcast lesson to provide continuity. Because we are training teachers, we wanted to all be able to use the same lesson plan format. So if someone introduces, this is what we're going to call this. These are the terms we're going to use. This is the format we will use for our lesson plans. We wanted that to carry through all of those classes. So we had an instructor who volunteered to create a podcast. This is how it works. So we can all go back to it. Our students can all go back to it. And we're all using the same language. Group training. We have really involved our faculty to brainstorm what would you like to do next so we don't have a set agenda with them. Jim's been great about that. When he comes in to work with our group, we may be talking about D2L. He may come in and assume we're going to start talking about discussions. But if somebody brings up the grade book, he's very willing to jump in and talk about what are your issues with grade books. So that's been very helpful for us. Our podcast ran from fall 2008 through fall 2009. We're still using some of those today, but we're still kind of revamping. So this, uh, this presentation is going to be a little bit um, in parallel whoops, with how our, uh, how our process uh, worked at Front Range. 
Um, Kathy is an idea person. She will often come into my office and say, got a minute? I've been thinking about this, and I'm not sure exactly how the implementation is going to go, but I really want to get instructor lessons best practices out for our whole department, which is where this uh, kind of conversation began. Um, the, uh, the podcast idea came up before I was hired at um, Front Range. So when I joined in December of 2008, there was also already some momentum. This, uh, this process was underway. Um, but I was able to participate that spring as we moved into the actual lessons. So what did we do? Let's, let's assume that you're coming into uh, a workshop where you've never done a podcast. How can we engage you so that, first of all, you're going to see a value in it, and second of all, that you're going to see, I can do that. And it's the I can do that part that I think um, we learned most about from the podcast. We, we did boil it down into steps and provided a lot of support. Um, and I'm going to show you what those steps are. But it turns out that making podcasts the way we ended up going had some, um, some difficulties that advised what we did later. So basically, there was a, an early uh, group of lessons where we introduced people to using a SANSA. Now, a SANSA is a device I still like very much. They used to have a simpler one. That's the kind we bought, where a $29 um, device can be used to capture and record, geez, how long? Ten, 12 hours? It was a long time. So you could just hang it on your neck and talk. And as long as it wasn't facing your shirt and brushing against your necklace, you could pretty, pretty much hear very well. They did a great job of capturing, capturing a, um, a room um, of conversation, much better than any of the video products that I've seen. Now they have larger color screens and such, and also you can... Uh, uh, use it as a portable hard drive, and it picks up FM radio. So um, it, it's a very cheap, easy, uh, easily identifiable silver bullet device. And that, I think, helped. And it was also silver that helped, too. Um, next, we introduced, um, after it was, here's how to record, here's how to capture, here's how to download into uh, a workstation, we introduced people to having iTunes University accounts. Now, Front Range Community College has been working with the folks at iTunes University um, since uh, the fall of 08. And along the way, um, it was our, our job to establish a space, which we did, to establish a population, to populate that space with uh, audio or video um, podcasts, and then to broadcast so that they're useful in our own community. And then there's that next step to be public and to say, we've got these resources to share with the broader community. If you go on to iTunes University right now and don't search for anything, you'll see uh, some lectures from Harvard and Yale and Stanford. And it's very, a very prestigious uh, company to stay with. And now Front Range is represented and searchable there. Um, OK, so the problem was not with, here's how to do it, here's how to capture, here's how to run your account. The problem was after that lesson ended, and now you are those teachers. I've, I've, got, I've got my Sansa. I'm recording. I'm saving. Now, what were the steps to get onto iTunes University? And how do I upload? And the, the extended um, steps, I think, were difficult for the people who weren't all, already naturally driven um, to dive in with this. So we looked at that and said, we can learn and we can grow. But before we move on, we're going to go ahead and show you um, an example of how people can access um, the information that we put up on iTunes U. So the first step was making it accessible within your community. So what we did was we asked the, um, the folks who run our website to put up a page. So our website's frontrange.edu, so it's um, that address slash iTunes U. And when you come to that page, you have a description with a couple ideas that, oh, there's something to, um, to, uh, to get to in terms of resources and a link directly into it. Now, iTunes University is, by its nature, uh, a part of iTunes. That's the um, device through which uh, we can see it. And what's happening is it's launching iTunes. And, um, and uh, hopefully, it's going to come up now. Yes. OK. So right in your iTunes area. And so great. I can see that I am in friendly territory. I'm, I'm looking for front range. I found front range. and. Uh, the interface took a little bit of design. There were some decisions made on the administrative side. So if you decide to go this route, you want to dedicate, dedicate a hero or a champion who's going to manage it and make everyone feel like they've got a place here and that you don't end up with 35 separate categories made by 35 separate people um, out of touch with one another. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand off the mic so that Kathy can show you some of the podcasts which we posted, as long as we're here. 
our original idea was we wanted to create an ESL library for students. So if they wanted to practice, say, oh, I don't know, grammar and punctuation that day if they were so inclined or really wanted to go look at another conversation or listen to something, they could go to this site that their instructor could say, here are some good examples for you or here are some good speeches. We also put some on our, um, our TUSL students were creating some of those. So in our, one of our classes, they were creating practice lessons for ESL students. The one I'm going to share with you today is from my EDU 275 class, which is um, teaching ESL in the content areas. And I, the goal of this activity was to really give instructors an idea of what it feels like for an ESL student in your classroom. Now, most people assume, oh, you're going to speak to me in a foreign language, and I'm going to have to try and understand. No, I'm going to speak to you in English. But I think it's worth listening to a couple minutes of this just to see the purpose of this activity works much better as a podcast than it would in a lesson. And it also makes it something very easy for you to say, here's something you could do outside of class. I want you to listen to this and then come back to class. So, we're going to go ahead and invite you to uh, play along if you want to experience this. Um, grab a pen and, uh, and work on the back of your, of your uh, yellow sheet, if you like, and, and let's see how this goes. And we won't listen to the whole thing, but it will give you an idea and why this is so powerful. and define some important terms and concepts related to content area instruction. Okay. okay, let me stop it. Let's try again to see if I can get the microphone involved. We are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> There's a jack here to plug into speakers. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to say because of the technical expertise needed to make that happen is beyond me. Um, I'm going to say, let's, uh, uh, why don't I have uh, you describe a little bit more completely? Can you? Uh, I've done this enough times, I can probably give this to you pro off the top of my head. But what I want you to do right now is, and the best part of this is when you don't see me, you don't have that visual input either. And that's part of what's so effective is when you're taking notes in a college classroom a lot of times, you have your head down and as an ESL student, you are a little bit anxious because you're trying to make sure you get all the important points anyway. This may, this may do it, let's see. Goal number two. Oh, okay. The goal, this goal is to increase your awareness of what's note-taking and empathy-building activity. There are two goals. Goal number one is to identify and define some important terms and concepts related to content area instruction and second language acquisition. Goal number two. The goal, this goal is to increase your awareness of what second language learners experience in content area classes. To complete this assignment, you will need a quiet place to take notes from a short lecture. It is important for this activity that you take handwritten notes using paper and pen or pencil, something to write with. Please listen to the entire mini lecture. Don't pause or rewind during the lecture. It will take approximately 10 minutes. Now, pause the recording until you are ready to start taking notes. You're ready. Ready? First, I want you to switch your writing instrument to your non-dominant hand. If you're right-handed, you should use your left hand to take notes. If you're left-handed, use your right hand. If you are truly ambidextrous, you're very fortunate. <laughs> Before we begin talking about second language acquisition and content instruction for ESL students, it's crucial that we have a common understanding of some important terms. Here are the five terms. The first two are acronyms coined by Jim Cummins. Number one is BICS, B-I-C-S, Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. This refers to basic conversational proficiency and can be learned in a matter of hours. Cummins describes BICS as the tip of the iceberg. Number two 
is CALP, C-A-L-P, Cognitive Academic Language Production. This is the language needed for analysis, comprehension, and synthesis of material in the content areas. So I would go on and give you the three other, and then I start to speed up a little bit because you know as instructors a lot of times we realize, oh my gosh, I only have a certain amount of time. And after about five minutes, most people have given up and are very frustrated. And obviously this is not good teaching, but this is what it feels like. So how did you feel in just a few seconds? Did you get the terms down? Just the acronyms. The acronyms. And, and some of the terms, I've chosen the long terms and I'm not simplifying them. Because what happens to second language learners is that they speak that common English. They speak a language that's the hello, hi, how are you, the social language when they come into your classroom. And we assume, well, they understand English, but we get into that very academic language that's very difficult and very specific to our content areas. And those are terms that are not familiar to them. And they start trying to take notes, and it's like trying to write with your non-dominant hand. You don't have all of that language. So that's something I want them to experience, and this is a great way for them to do it. And, and a lot of them admit they pause because they really think the goal is to get all of these terms down, and we spend the whole semester talking about the terms. So another example I'd like to share with you is, um, if we can get back to it, another way we use this in our at Front Range is um, we have ESL students who have gone through our program and are then ready, they feel, to go into a regular classroom. Some classrooms are more friendly in that way than others. So we have kind of a test we can give them. We've got podcasts of several instructors, and we let them listen and say, here is, and actually I walked into Cherry Emerson's classroom and said, can I, can I podcast you today? Are you okay if I just sit here and record what you say? And our students then can listen to that and say, Boy, if I was in that classroom, would I feel comfortable? Is this something I can understand? We've given that podcast to advisors to say, here's a test. Here's a way to find out. Could you take this class? So Cherry is, pardon? You've never heard it? It's not as difficult as the, as the one you listen to about me. how old this is. What you don't have that, that Cherry provided during that time was her syllabus and the information that was up on the, on the, the board for them to read. But it gives them a, an example of what it's like to be in a regular classroom, how fast we talk, what kind of uh, you know, phrases we use that they may not be familiar with, idioms, those kinds of things. So I think those are two good examples of, of our pot, use of podcasts. We are in the process of reorganizing the ones that we have set up for our ESL students, mainly because some of the things that we didn't realize in the beginning, when you have a library, uh, somebody has to take charge of organizing it, making sure that everything in there is organized in a way that students can find it. So we're working on that at this point. We haven't had that issue, and I know that is an issue. Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a student. Yeah. Okay. 
dragon? That will, okay. Good point. So, so the question was, how do we handle people with learning, um, I'm sorry, with visual differences and or audio differences when we're handling it um, by transcripting? And the answer is, we don't. And uh, and the, the observation was made correctly um, that it's if you're going to be using podcasts, you need to uh, address that. Um, at the, uh, what's the, it's not Fusion. There's another conference at Elk. At Elk. Um, we, uh, we saw some great resources about the transcripting process that includes um, capture from a, a podcast file uh, where you can use some commonly um, available tools, some of which are free, uh, to create a very reasonable transcript in a short period of time. So um, if you make this part of your curriculum that's uh, obligatory, then that's an obligatory step too as well. We agree. So our next step after podcasting was we wanted to look at a variety of other tools so it's for our department, not just podcasting. So our first step was we talked to the department members and asked, what would you like to learn about? What would you like to be able to use? What tools are you curious about? And everyone had a, uh, a different tool that they liked and knew how to use. So we, we'll, we will use that this year as part of our planning. So. Our ongoing presentation series is very informal. As I mentioned, when, when Jim comes in and we invite him in and we say we're going to talk about, this is our goal for talking about this today, we may stray from that topic because the needs of our department are so varied. Um, we encourage practice. Our sessions are about four hours in length. We spend some time at the very beginning with training about this is how it works, here's a tool that you could try, and there are about half of our session is spent practicing. How can I use this? Let's tr let's try and make it work. Let's give you an opportunity to set it up. So all of our instructors this semester will be using D2L in one way or another. We're all being asked to put our syllabus on a D2L site and a, using a discussion possibly. So we haven't gone a whole lot farther than that. Okay. So you've heard some of the some of the planning. Again, this this generally. We'll follow a pattern of, of Kathy work, uh, working within her department, and she's got a wonderful department chair, April Menzies, who is supportive and helps find resources and time for these sort of things, and also is very willing to say, we will all use syllabus in our classes or, or something like that. Yes, question. The question is, do the instructors all, all come together physically to the same place for the training? And the answer is, so far, yes. And part of what we're doing is trying to develop resources that are available outside of those moments as well. Uh, how do we get them into the room? Good question. Um, there's, there's a couple answers to this. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Kathy uh, start down that road. In, in the For our podcasting, we did not compensate our instructors at all. It was just a matter of this is going to be offered. We'd really like to, for you to be a part of it. And they came in on their own time on a Fridays. We didn't get everybody every time. So that was part of the collaboration was can, is there a colleague that you can work with who can bring you up to speed? Is there someone who can help you with the points that you're missing or if you need support? Or Jim's always available. <laughs> has always been available for us and has been very generous with his time. <laughs> so it's not easy, though. You're right. To help address that question along the way, again, um, Kathy had, has applied for and taken advantage of um, online learning's grant system. Um, so there has been some compensation available from those funds for people to come in and also to purchase food so that we can say we'll feed you when you're there. And of course, any meeting, if you want it be su to be successful, you feed people at it. And I didn't provide any food today for this. Yeah. Um, at our college, if we're training people, we're paying them. Mm -hmm. um, it's that simple. It's important. We've got 400 adjuncts and 50 regular faculty. Yep. Everyone had to learn D2L. We paid them to learn it. Um, we have another incentive, and that is you don't have to learn D2L. But whoever is going to be teaching your course in the fall will. Okay, <laughs> the observation was made. Um, and, and what college are you at, sir? Uh, Community College of Aurora. At Community College of Aurora, 
um, if you want people to attend training, um, you compensate them for their time. Uh, they had a situation with 500 and, um, and 400 adjuncts, all of which um, need to use it. And although they were not required to attend the training, they were required uh, that it was used to teach their courses in the fall. So if they wanted to be that person, it's helpful to get the training. Good. Um, in any case, we, we, have, we have the people in the room now, and we've got someone ready to, to lead some lessons. So what are we going to do? What, what are the, the topics that we're, we're going to engage people with? And again, what I don't want to do is to say, here's the, uh, the Epiglottis 2000C, and it's going to be the, the best thing you've ever seen at the thing you never knew you wanted to do. I'm going to teach you how to, how to do it and, and send you on your way. Um, we all have an epiglottis already, so that's probably a poor choice. Um, but we wanted to give people something that they actually would be able to use over an extended period of time, practice, and have it be relevant to their daily class. Um, so we chose at first to talk about Desire to Learn's content management. As many of you may uh, be aware, in Desire to Learn, you can upload a variety of content, but there are some management skills that I think are helpful to keep it organized, um, to group things, to move things. Um, different types of media that are available that you can display within it. So we spent some time, again, I, I walked through organizational practices, how to move, reorder, restructure, um, how, to, how to tell whether what you've uploaded is going to be usable by ev ev anyone who comes to your class. An example is that many people, when they submit a syllabus to Desire to Learn, will use the original Word document. And there's a couple of reasons why that um, can be a bad idea, um, because that document can therefore be downloaded, edited, printed and brought back to you to show you what you're doing wrong when it wasn't your words. Um, it also can look differently. Um, page two may start at a different place when you print it than when I print it. Um, and that document um, may not resemble what you put out there in the first place anyway. So we talk about the value and reason why you would um, generate a PDF and the process by doing so. And then we practice it. Um, and again, the, uh, the idea is to create a permanent document. We're always beating the drum, go PDF. Um, and there's another angle there, go with HTML, use the, um, use the tool as it exists in Desire to Learn to make your own pages. Um, we then uh, segued over into the next thing, and both of these are ones that we felt people would actually use, upload a syllabus, upload documentation, schedule, those types of things, and start using the grades tool. How many of you have the question at the start of class, um, how did I do on the last, uh, last assignment? And then 15 minutes later, boy, that hand looks familiar. Um, how, how am I doing in class now? And, and I'm overstating it that by the end of the class, they're asking you again. But in, there's some truth to, uh, to that. You do hear from your students frequently about when, uh, when is that going to be in there? What, what's my grade now? How does this fit? Um, so by using the grades tool, not only can we uh, put things out uh, for each individual student to find for themselves, we can also do a demonstration at the front of the class. I can show you my organization so we can use the demo student role and I can show you some scores that are in place for demo right now. So we can see the demo's in trouble if they don't get this type of assignment done on this schedule. Can any of you relate to that? Ah, you might not have it in yet. Let's, let's get on the stick. So those types of communications, I think, are helpful. So not only talking about the tool and how to use it, but probably, uh, I think, illustrating a couple of situations that can um, come out of um, using it in specific ways helps people say, OK, I'll start it. But you better be there to help me. And that's why we wanted to continually offer uh, ongoing training. And of course, uh, I, I always broadcast, come and see me, call me, and I will help you. And fortunately, people do. Um, they follow up and, and get those answers. So I think without support, it's kind of hard to ask people to go the extra mile. But if you demonstrate it loud and clear, uh, I think that's a social element uh, for success. Um, the next thing I did was something that I felt was not a broadly um, obvious tool to use, which was to use a, a flip camera to capture video and then upload into uh, YouTube, which means we need to make YouTube accounts, um, and then learning how to link to or embed into Desire to Learn. Now, over the last month, uh, we've learned that the link to part can fail because uh, YouTube's policies about how they distribute their video have changed. Uh, they force you to go to their site rather than to link directly from your site and show it in frame. Um, the way around that that we are advocating for our instructors to use is to embed. And again, if you're a brand new instructor saying, I'm going to embed video that I captured and I uploaded to YouTube and linked, you better be there for me. And again, if that was the first thing we did, I think people would have said, hey, thanks, thanks for the lunch and, and left and I wouldn't have seen them again. But I think by starting with some tools that were logical, usable, and pretty straightforward, 
and then to step next into tools which were slightly more involved but had a greater return, and then to come to something that might have been a little bit more of a stretch. It feels like a, a successful process. I think the follow-up um, where the department says, we are going to, as a group, do this. Oh, you need to do one of these. Upload your syllabus. Use the gradebook. Those are the logical ones. The next question that I'm hoping to, to hear from, uh, from Kathy is, how are we going to take that YouTube application, now that we've seen it, and make it into something we can do in a workshop in one day and make it useful right now? So uh, I think following, following up your lessons with direct context that's usable in a lesson today, I think, is an essential piece. The neatest tool, um, if I'm not using it this, this month, will be a great memory, perhaps, um, instead of something that I'm using in class right now. Let's come back to Kathy for this one. Am I coming back too soon? I know. I was thinking we just kind of covered most of that. OK. Oh, that's true. OK. Let's keep going. Superfluous yeah. slide. Nothing to see here. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we have done is, um, in order to give our faculty a chance to practice some of this, we've created what we call a, a resource site. Um, we have a D2L site for our department right now, and we are using those tools. So our department chair has been, do we want to, some of the, are we going to go to it with this? Um, so these are some of the tools we've used, but I can show you what we have. It's in progress right now because it will be something that our faculty will decide this is what we want to put on it, this is how we want to use it. But so far we have a, uh, a welcome message. Uh, we've got a plan for our fall, for our uh, workshops. So we want to hear from them. What do you want to look at this fall? What tools would you like to learn? How is this going to work this fall? So here is our D2L resource site. So we have our welcome back message. <laughs> that was from last, last spring. And an embedded video to YouTube. <laughs> because, <laughs> yes, because we, have, we used that last spring. So we have syllabus language, um, sample syllabi. And our faculty then will be asked to submit their syllabus to our department chair via the Dropbox this time. One of the goals then is to have everything on one site. Everything will be here, all of the uh, messages from our department chair, all of the things that we have. There's our Dropbox. So our department chair doesn't have to chase everyone down to say, do I have your syllabus yet? Check through her email. Have you sent it to me? Well, I can't open this. I, all of that. It's all going to be there for her. Um, she's given us a syllabus language because, as you know, there's a certain vocabulary, certain verbiage that needs to be in your syllabus. So she has a sample syllabus and from a class from this summer, all kinds of information, probably more than you ever wanted to know about what, what you need in your syllabus, what words you need, what exact vocabulary, all of that, why it has to be there. So we're actually using it as a communication tool. So hopefully this will give them some practice with it. On our discussion page right now, uh, is the plan for our fall workshops. What we're going to do this time is ask faculty to each identify a tool they're going to use for the fall semester. When we come back in the spring, we will have training, training sessions on those. So I know, for example, that Barbara Ulrich really wants to know how to use the smart board. She's going to contact Jim. He will help her. <laughs> so she has a chance to try it with her class, find out how it works. She can come back to us as a group and say, this has been my experience. I used it this way. Here's a way you might use it. And then if someone's interested, Jim is right there to say, let's all talk about it. Or if everyone says, I really don't want to try that. It isn't useful for me. It's not something we have to worry about. But I think being able to really use that site and really be a part of it will be a good practice for everyone again. So one of the things that, that Kathy are doing next is looking forward. We have a, a, a couple of different groups that we're working with. There are current faculty and current students um, that we're trying to, to reach with our podcasts and to reach with our faculty resource site for this department. Um, but part of the t reason those people are showing up is because we won a grant, and that grant helped pay for um, the cost of people attending and food. So part of what we're doing is scrambling to see where's the next grant coming from. And another part of it is to seeing can we make it um, an essential uh, tool so that they're going to they're come whether or not we find uh, those funds. 
So cost is, is a big picture uh, question. How can we sustain uh, our momentum? And I think that different colleges, especially um, when they're not looking to send you to out of state uh, professional development opportunities, might be more interested in funding in-house ones. So we're hoping to, to get in on that. Um, another element that we've talked about a little bit um, is time. When can we get people together? Um, herding cats aside, what is, the, uh, what, what is harder than getting a group of people who are coming in on, and fitting this class that they teach out of a very tight schedule in their life? And that class is Tuesday from 1 to, uh, 1, or to 2.50. And if I want to pull them together with everyone else, we've got to find common time. We've got to find impetus. So keep making sure that they know that there's a history of relevant tools and that there's been a history of support and the department is trying to adopt some of these into what they're doing, I think that helps inspire. Um, not everything, and, and down here in the focus, not everything is applicable for everyone. So if I find that there are some people who say, YouTube was very interesting, move along, I need to be responsive to that person as much as the, as the, the group that's excited. So the part where Kathy has asked for their input about what direction we're going in next, and in the, the site, you may have seen the discussion topic was, what do you, what do you want to do with this? Where, where's our emphasis? Where I can read ideas from other people. Hey, someone else was talking about um, this use for embedded YouTubes. Maybe there is place for it in my classwork as well. I think that's helpful. But bottom line is, we're aiming for practical benefits. So the latest conversation that Kathy and I had was, she came in and said, I'm excited. Boy, the, the things we've done with the TESOL students and the podcasts um, and some of the other sharing we've done with D2L really went well. They are all out teaching English as a second language around the globe. They keep calling me up and saying, can we get back into that class because we have things to share to one another? And it turns out that you could probably work it out. I could manufacture some accounts for our graduates every time they go out into the world and roll them in a desire to learn class but I think we're kind of stretching beyond the intended use of D2L in that case. So what we talked about was using Google Docs as a resource that um, can be broadcast and initially created, designed, formulated by Kathy with, uh, with my input, but eventually to find um, one or more students who are willing to take the leadership with that role and decide what additional tools um, or uses could be uh, put, uh, put into place there. So we're, we like Google Docs because it's free. We like it because everyone's got a Gmail account, so it's already, you're, you're, you're halfway there. And I know not everyone does. I'm speaking in generalities. But it's a, at least a commonly visible tool that, for the time being, has the stability of a company that's not going to go away. So many times we find free uh, tools out there that turn into pay sites, and all of a sudden they're not, eh, it's not looking that useful, so maybe I'll find a new one. I think Google is sticking around. Um, and we also want to find that next silver bullet. We've come up with a couple, couple ideas that happen to fit with uh, the needs of our department. But what is the next idea? And that's where we're happy that you came here. Um, we would love to hear ideas from people about either things that you're considering, thinking about. Um, it's, I haven't told anybody yet, but I was thinking one nice thing for, for my class might be, well, we're, we're, we have that conversation every month. and. Maybe it's going to go somewhere, and maybe we'll next year say, the thing we chose was this great inspirational idea or something we saw here at Colt. But I would, I would love to know if any of you, as we talk about what applicable technology tool could give you leverage with your instructors or with your students um, so that we can begin to, to um, borrow your ideas and fold them back into what we're doing. So, and if there's no ideas, then that's terrible. But <laughs> yes? Okay, the, the, the suggestion is Camtasia. T tell me about your application. What, what way would you like to see it used? Using it to annotate um, PowerPoint. Okay, the use of Camtasia to annotate PowerPoint. And in other words, we're going to take a screen capture utility. And I agree, that's, that's a great one. Um, Camtasia is something that, we have, uh, that has an expense associated with it. My department, Online Learning, recognizing that, purchased X number of copies to go on laptops that we enable people to sign out. So that's something absolutely we can do, and I think it makes great sense. For those of you who don't uh, see Camtasia appearing in your budget, there's a, uh, there's a, for now, free tool called screencastomatic.com with hyphens around the O. 
and that does some of the things that Camtasia does, and it's, the nice thing is you don't need to be on any specific machine. It's web-based, so I can go there right now and uh, provide a description. All you need is a mic and a, a laptop to, uh, to capture. Excellent. So just to summarize for the mic, um, at Ames Community College, the instructional designer there has worked with instructors to use Camtasia to capture uh, what was a static document in a, in a course syllabus and to give it some more active um, visual flair, um, voiceover, photograph of the instructor. So basically changing it into something that's going to be um, more dynamic and memorable. And then to take that finished Camtasia document and share it with other instructors so that they can see the benefit. Um, an instructional designer at their best can be inspirational, but it's much more convincing when you see someone using it in a classroom setting. Good. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. The suggestion was that Camtasia Relay, a less expensive costing uh, product, can be used by instructors to grade student papers on a live screen, recording their narration with it, so that a, a student could get more out of what the comments are, rather than what um, might just be written on the page. The student gets the completed edited paper back as well so they can see whatever note-taking te uh, technique in place. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, what, what, we're, what we're hoping here, and, and Kathy, if, if, if I don't touch it exactly, let me know. Um, what we're hoping here, as we have a series, um, if we know that uh, we're going to be seeing you at least four times this semester on Friday from 10 to 2, um, we factor in that time where we're out there kind of soliciting. We're not, we're not looking for heroes necessarily, just, people, just the normal everyone, uh, everyday person like you. And they, were, they started using SmartBoard. Why don't you let's schedule 10 minutes of our time so I can show you how I'm using the smart board and you can say, mm, I, that, that applies, but maybe I would do it differently to start a conversation. So it's using this regular form to bring people back in. Um, and yes, there are methods via podcast, screencast, or video that we could share pretty much whenever you want to go look on the, the resource site. But I think that face-to-face -face time is a pretty key element in that. Um, does, did I speak, speak accurately? Does, Yes.
So the suggestion was made to use a pen cast. I think we're referring to live scribe pens there. Um, and especially for a math instructor, it's difficult to, in typing, get the idea back out so that um, anyone who's looking at the document can see what you meant. So with a, a live scribe pen, you can begin narrating, say, here's the original problem. And um, one of the problems with live scribe that I find is that I stop and slow down while I'm writing. And it's impossible to listen to. So instead, we'll, and we've, we've been working with LiveScribe, and this is a good candidate for what we're going to show next, is we'll prepare text, and then we'll start recording after we've got the skeleton in place, and we'll just flesh out some muscle here and there. But especially when you're working with formulas and this question that in a face-to-face -face class, I would have answered at the board so you all can see, well, in effect, I'm giving you the board so that you can watch and rewatch and rewatch. Um, even if you're um, not in that setting. So I think that's a, an excellent use of it. Um, I'm a little worried about time. Let me make sure that we're not going over. OK, good. Um, what is our stop time? We started at 1.30, so I think we've got four minutes left. So um, maybe if there's any, any more suggestions or uh, ideas that we'd like to share. And, and if not, then uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? The suggestion was made that GPS technology can be um, used in a variety of contexts and that most instructors don't have um, a, a clear picture right off, right off the bat about how that might be used or even what the technology is capable of. This is part of a lecture series that, uh, which college are you at? California. California is, is using. Tell me, tell, California University of? Uh, California State University, Channel Islands. California State University, Channel Islands. OK. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. We, you, you've been you've been patient and helpful and re, and responsive, and we really appreciate um, having that much feedback. Uh, it's great to see uh, um, the interest there. And one of the things I'd like to leave you with is um, we're working each independently in our own tasks, and we have a lot of common ground that we're covering. So it does help uh, me to elaborate to you about what we're doing, because already I'm thinking about a little differently about how we might move forward. And just in the same way, it, it's very helpful if we can hear back from you, if you want to collaborate with us, if you've got some ideas, some projects, or you'd like to try a, a, an inter-college um, uh, sharing opportunity, we are definitely uh, interested and available. So let us know. Um, here's our contact information. We promise not to be this, uh, screaming at you when you do. And thanks so much for your time today.